And now, let's port together Debian porting fun for everyone by P2 and Steve Langasek. Hello, I'm, I'm P2 and I will start this workshop by giving an overview on all sorts of portability issues. And Steve will then proceed with a more practical uh, point of view and will also do the workshop the real workshop where people are supposed to be helping in finding some example bugs or solving some example bugs. I will first uh, cover some portability issues which are general to the to C programming and, and pro application level programming on uh, Linux systems or also other Unix systems. And I will then for, uh, go on by explaining some more hardware related bits and also on problems with writing uh, portable code which talks to the hardware. Then Steve will continue with some more practical budgeting. The first thing would obviously be why are we pr trying to write portable code? There are uh, various reasons to do that. First is correctness. I mean, there's a, there are C language and other language standard definitions and programs are supposed to be as close to that as possible. And porting it to different architecture is a good way of exercising this portability and to verify if the code actually adheres to the rules. Debian calls itself the universal operating system. You can't obviously can't make that claim if you run only on one architecture. That's rather similar, uh, rather clear, I think. Debian is also the most used Debian embedded distribution, although that might sound fairly strange. What's actually meant is that Debian is very often used as a basis for people deriving their own custom distribution for embedded platforms. As you m might note, embedded platforms tend to use all sorts of non-Intel or non-standard EA32 uh, CPU architectures. So portability is quite important there. Um, hardware advances will also make Debian feasible on new platforms. Think of mobile phones, which probably in a few years come with like 256 megabytes of memory and a 1.8 inch hard disk of like 40 gigs or more, which is more than some people have on their desktop at the moment. It's also an, very nice and funny to play with other architectures and systems because it gives you a completely different view on how you can do computing. Um, I will show you, it can be quite different. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah. Um, the question was, it's still Debian, how different can it be? But you will see it can be quite different. There are quite some differences in the underlying hardware which sh still show up even for application programmers. I will start off by do doing some the C type, the, the generic C type problems. There is a definition in ANSI C which has, um, the explains how the how the types relate, like you see there, the, the character has always to be sh uh, smaller or equal to a short uh, int and a long. Um, a long is always at least 32 bit, and an int and a short are at least 16 bit. One important thing to note is that a pointer is not necessarily an int. Um, there's a, mainly older Unix software assumes this, and it this breaks si seriously on 64 bit machines because they tend to use 64-bit ints, but 32-bit uh, int, but 64-bit pointers. Another mm, l less well-known problem is that the signedness of a char is also architecture dependent. On most systems, a char is signed, like on Intel, but on PowerPC, for example, a char is unsigned. Now, if you use a char as a loop counter and you do a decrementing loop, and you just check if it's never below zero, then, yeah, well, you just create an infinite loop. Um, some tips to, to avoid this sort of issues. Use, uh, use int as much as possible. The C language standard specifies that int is normally the, f the fastest way to do any n simple uh, in integer operations. The only reason to use something else would be if you have to communicate with an external system or have to write a file, send a message over a network or something like that. And the standard for that protocol specifies you have to use an 8-bit or a 16-bit or whatever entity. 
In that case, since ISO C99, we have nice types which, which help us there. Um, never, try to think, never try to abuse scars for, to save memory. It's useless to think that, you, that your program will use me less memory because if you use a char to help as a loop counter, even if you know that it will never have more than 256 loops to do. And an also nice is that the newer GCC versions give you far more warnings and sometimes errors if you violate these rules. So the, most of the problems can be found at compile time. Bit fields is another tricky area, as you can see on the slide. There is a, there are actually two ways of representing a bit field. So you see that there, that the, uh, there is a structure with two bit fields. One bit field zero, which is three bits, and bit field one, which is five bits. On an ER32, it looks like the uh, first line, so the, lo the, lo the bit field zero will be in the lower three bits, and bit field one will be in the upper th three bits. Obviously, PowerPC guys decided that it should be different, and they put a first bit field of three bits in the upper three bits. Now guess what ca happens if you try to port code which doesn't know about this. And the NS is another common problem. There are obviously more than, there's obviously more than one way to represent a multi-byte entity. And as if, if there is more than one way, it will also be used. Consider this interesting number, zero uh, x, so in hex number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In little engine, you will first see that the lower two uh, nibbles or the lower byte will be f the in, on the lower memory location, so seven, eight, and then so on, five, six, three, four, one, two. In a big engine, it's just the other way around. And for Tora, we also taught on PDP and DNS. But that, I don't think that's very much used in practice anymore. So you don't really have to care about it. But the Linux kernel still provides micros for that. Um, NDNS mainly matters in external interfaces again, because protocols, file formats, and stuff like that define, typically define in which NDNS you have to provide the data. So that means you have to do conversions if you because otherwise you, you would not uh, adhere to the spec. The best way is to use macros to convert to always to, to use macros which convert the the data between the CPU and the NS, which is yeah obviously CPU specific and the and the NDNS you actually want to use. Never rely on the fact that that if you write an int, you will be that it will always be little onion or big onion. Alignment is another problem, generally on uh, RISC CPUs. Um, most RISC CPUs require an aligned access. An aligned access means that if you do an access of an entity which is larger than one byte, for example, a 16-bit or a 32-bit access, the address has to be a multiple of two bytes or four bytes, or in case of a 64-bit access, an eight-byte. Now, Intel processors, ER32 processors and AMD64, typically handle the unaligned cases in hardware by doing multiple fetches and combining the results in the right way. Risk processors generally don't do that, so they either rely on traps, so if you do an unaligned access, an exception will be generated, an exception handler in the kernel will, un will trap this and will do the necessary accesses and com combining stuff uh, in software. Obviously, this is slow because you have to take an exception and you have to run quite a few instructions to do the work. And it also is not possible in kernel land on some architectures. So if you're, tri if you're writing kernel drivers, you can't rely on this. And obviously, on a, if you have to do an exception, an unaligned access will be never be atomic. So if you do a store of an four, for a four byte entity of a 32 bit word, on an unaligned access, you cannot be sure, on an unaligned address, you cannot be sure that the store will be handled before someone else writes to this location. But even on Intel, um, this is not, it, in an, on an SMP system, an unaligned access can also be un, not atomic. So better try not to use unaligned access at all. Now that's not always possible, because some protocols use structures which have unaligned fields, and then, yeah, you have to do it, <laughs> otherwise you can't use the protocol. In some cases, the compiler can help you by generating, by generating code. In other cases, you have to write a special function which does the unaligned access for you, which is generally faster than trying to do it by kernel traps. There is also one architecture, at least one architecture I know, which is ARM, which does not trap for unaligned access, but just gives you interesting results. So be aware. 
that's ARM. Actually, ARM processors can generate exceptions, but due to historic reasons, this is not used in Linux. Perhaps it changes for the new ABI, I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah. First time. So, so my name is Dan Frazier. There, there's a tool that works on at least IA64. I'm not sure about the other architectures called PRKiddle. And with PRKiddle, you can actually tell it to change the behavior of a process when it hits one of these traps, and you can make it maybe crash, and then get a backtrace, and it makes it a lot easier to debug. Yes, that's in so, yeah, in, on, uh, that's in, in that's possible on some architectures which do generate traps. On Alpha, for example, you can have it generate a kernel message when an unaligned access happens, so you at least know that, that that there is an application. You also know which process is actually triggering the unaligned uh, access. Yeah, and Chip. Yeah, my name is Riku Voipia, and the, on, on ARM, it actually is possible to trap them on current system, but the kernel default, defaults on undefined behavior. So there's a proc variable you can set to make it like segfault the application or fix the analog access. Okay. Any more any more questions on this part? If you don't mind, I'd like to follow up on Dan's comment about uh, PRCTL. I I'm over here. It's your co-presenter. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, Steve, yes, I didn't uh, see you. Yes, PRCTL. Um, very nice tool, by the way. Uh, has actually been ported now to HPPA, IA64, and Alpha. Um, the Alpha port went in, and I think 2.6.16 is the first kernel that actually supports the necessary interface upstream to be able to do that. But those are the three architectures that we now have that support, where we can um, look at unaligned traps, which are normally handled by the kernel. But for performance reasons, we really don't want them to be happening anyway. And so this is a great tool for actually being able to debug those on those architectures. Of course, if you're running Spark, you have no choice. It throws you a SIG bus no matter what. And um, we'll get to see some of those a little bit later on in the, in the presentation. OK. Uh, so this concludes the part on, the, uh, on some of the application layer or application level issues you might encounter. I will now give you a quick overview on how systems and buses look like in modern systems or how they can look like because there are thousands of variations possible obviously but I will give you a few hints on how it can be done and I will then go in further detail on how hardware accessing how accessing peripheral hardware works and what sort of uh, pitfalls you have to be aware of. So I will first start with what is a bit of the classical Intel system. It's not entirely up to date because the newer generation Intels don't really look like this anymore. But most systems which are currently in use, like Pentium 3s and some of the Pentium 4 systems, have an architecture which is vaguely like this. So there is what is generally called a CPU complex. It can be one or more CPUs, um, which is which share one bus to the main bridge to the outside world, which is called a North Bridge. Um, the North Bridge generally has an interface to the memory subsystem, which is mostly SDRAM or DDR2 or 3 or whatever they found these days. Um, and it also, and on the other hand, it also has PCI and AGP. Um, PCI is one of the m most important expansion buses which are in the current systems, although this is being replaced. With PCI Express, I will show you on the next slide how that architecture looks like. AGP is actually invented for graphics cards because the graphics people obviously always need more bandwidth than the standard bus can provide. So they, they made a sort of a hack on PCI. They added a way to, to do prefetching, basically to send commands bef while the current command is being processed, and which allows for, for uh, faster access. It because it reduces the latency of the transactions. So the main components, as I said here, were the CPU complex. The South, the South Bridge is generally the, the ch a chip which is attached to the PCI bus, so it's, it's one of the, could be one of those device blocks on the lower part of the slide, and which bridges to, used to be ESA, but ESA bus is no longer implemented, but there is still stuff like the PS2 keyboard and mouse controller, the parallel port, the serial port, stuff like that. Um, and the, yeah, then the memory subsystem, obviously, front side bus, PGI, PCI, AGP. An Opteron SAR system is probably one of the most, one, one of the biggest changes 
which have happened fairly recently. As you can see, this is also a dual CPU ver uh, system, but instead of the CPUs sharing a single bus, they they have they, inter they co communicate with each other via a hypertransport link. Hypertransport is a narrow 8-bit, but very fast point-to-point -point link. It's not a bus. Every CPU has its own memory, or can at least have its own memory, but it can also access the memory of the other processor via by communicating over the hypertransport link. Obviously, accessing non-local memory is slightly slower than accessing local memory. Yes? No, I think it's like, uh, I don't exactly have any, but I think it's it's mo more like perhaps five or so, but it's, not, it's definitely not thousands, <laughs> it's not, a, not that bad. I mean, the Linux, I'm not sure if Linux kernel actually uses the the, the, the non-uniform memory architecture characteristics already to, for example, to to make sure that the process which runs on one processor is, has all its data on the, of as much as possible of its code and data in this, in this memory, in the, in the memory attached to the processor itself. Y yes? yes? Uh, <laughs> this was done in the 2.6 kernel for uh, uh, AMD E64. Okay, so the, it's implemented now. I knew that know that there was talk that they were speaking on doing this, but I didn't know if it was already implemented or not. It obviously makes sense to do it. Um, for the I/O part, there is a hypertransport PCI Express bridge. PCI Express is basically the successor of PCI, which is b becoming more and more popular, also in Intel-based systems. Um, it's it's narrow, it's a, basically a serial link, uh, 1.2 gigabit bidirectional. You can bundle them uh, to have more bandwidth. So it's, it's a sort of a scalable system. And it has the main advantage that it's, yeah, because it's serial, it's, it's, it uh, has some advantages which I will explain in the next slide. Behind the PCI Express bridge, you can either have PCI Express devices or, for, or, as, or as well, a PCI Express PCI bridge, which allows you to use normal or, well, old, whatever you want to call it, PCI cards in a PCI Express system. And obviously, behind the PCI bridge, you can still have the South bridge for connecting your PS2 keyboard. So the main interfaces are, as I said, as I already mentioned, the processors, a hypertransport PCI Express bridge, a PCI Express PCI bridge to connect existing PCI devices, and yeah, the interfaces I also mentioned already. Some trends in system design which, which somehow try to explain why we have this move to fast serial links. As you will have noticed, not only PCI Express, but also uh, ATA changed from a parallel to a serial interface. Um, and there are, I think there must be more. No, okay. Um, there are a few observations will which 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 explain this this strategy. First, CPUs. Yeah, f CPUs obviously have become much faster than memory for people who have been doing computing longer than so, uh, longer than a while. You will real, you will notice you will probably remember the C64 with a one megahertz processor in that and without caches because the memory was about as fast as the processor, so there was not an actual problem. But these days the processors are not like two to three gigahertz, and there's obviously no memory which can cope with that, at least not an off-chip memory. So we have caches to hide this, these delays and the, and the bandwidth. Peter? Yes? May I, may I ask another question? Um, if you go back to the current slide, yes. um, if that's possible, um, the this, one. Yes, this one. Yes. The, um, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the battery died. Okay. Um, ah, I see there's a new one. Thank you. Um, oh, it's working. No, obviously not. The, it's obviously faster to access a local bridge than to access a bridge on another processor. It's a net, you should see it as a sort of a switched network. I mean, the CPU will obviously allow you to access a bridge and the devices behind the bridge which are connected to the other processor, but it will always be faster to access them at your local 
system. This is why it's so scalable, because you don't have the single bottleneck of a bus, so you can actually add more processors and keep resources locally for, for high performance. Okay, so, yeah. The pro another problem is that bus and memory bandwidth have, have gone up quite a bit. If you remember that the ESA bus was like 8 megahertz and PCI, PCI was like 33, PCI X is like 133 megahertz. So the, the bandwidth is actually improved also for memory. Like we have now up to 206, well, DDR3 is like, I think, double clocked 133 megahertz or so. But the point is the latencies have not gone up in the same way. Accessing an SDRAM is actually quite slow for the first, for if you only want to access a single byte or word. Um, it, be, it only becomes fast if you, ma if you manage to use the burst modes. That obviously is usable, but is help, th in that there obviously caches help, because caches will automatically trigger a burst access to fetch a complete cache line. There are other things which help, like uh, DMA controllers are obviously very useful in this sort of system, because you can then program a, com a, a long transfer, and, the, um, and which will automatically lead to efficient bursts to both the bus and the expansion bus and the memory subsystem. Um, yeah, then parallel buses have problems when the speed goes up. The problem is that all lines have to be almost equally long because it's, because you you can't you have to wait before that all lines have the, have their correct state before you can actually sample them or at least you can only sample them when when they are all stable obviously. Um, this means that routing uh, buses fast buses on PCBs is is a very hard task, which which is why high speed serial links are actually are a solution. You would obviously wonder why didn't we do that before. Well, the problem is that you do need an, uh, quite so you do need extra logic to actually implement these high-speed serial links, and it's only became recently economically realistic to implement this ex this serializer deserializer logic on the chips. So before that, it was it, the logic took too much of the chip space to be economically realistic. Okay, now we I will go in, in more detail on some of the problems we can see if we try to access hardware or device registers. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is out-of-order transactions. As you can see in the small three-line or two-line assemb PowerPC assembler code, there are two stores. One, the value of register R20 is stored on the address uh, of R21 plus OX20 and same for R22. Now, you would think, ah, this is two instructions in sequence, so they will be executed in sequence. And if you look from the outside, the, the values will appear in sequence as, as in the same sequence as you write them there. Unfortunately, this is not true. At least some architectures, like PowerPC, for example, um, reorder the memory transactions because they they can sometimes be more efficient then. Obviously, if you try to write to hardware, if you write to memory, this is not a problem because it's always cached. And if you read it, you, and if you read, you read it back, the processor will read it from the cache, and it, and it will make sure that that you get it in the right order. And if it's not in the cache, the load will obviously stall until all the writes have been finished. Obviously, if you're writing to hardware, the sequence does actually matter because there is not the, there is another device that. Uh, there's a device at the other side which might expect writes to happen in a certain sequence. So that's why they have an extra instruction which is called EIAO and stands for in, uh, enforce, enforce in, in Order Execution of I.O. I think he first found a mnemonic and then looked for a nice explanation for it, but still. Um, also, bridge, bus bridges can lead to, can also do, can also reorder transactions in certain circumstances. And the way to, to have that is then to also to use a barrier instruction, but obviously if it's a bus, you, can't really, you don't have an explicit CPU control over that anymore. But in general, if you read, from, if you read all the uh, outstanding stores will be completed. So you can always do a store, then read from some dummy location, which is also on that bus, and, and that you will only get the result when the, when the ride is finished. And that way you have a sort of a barrier that you are sure that 
the rights happen in the order you want them to be happening. Then there is another quite common problem being non-coherent I.O., which is it's like you have DMA controllers and the processor, obviously. They all act as main memory, but the processor obviously has a cache, and not on, not on all systems is the cache coherent with regard to DMA transfers, which means that if, some, if another DM bus master or another DMA-capable device writes into memory, the processor might not have noticed. Uh, on this is this has not happened on Intel systems, which is why m not so many people know about this problem. But it's quite common on, on ARMs and also on some on the smaller MIP systems. There are a few things you can do to actually make it still work, even though you don't have the coherency. Um, you can either invalidate the cache lines, which will be written to, because the CPU programs the device, so you know which locations are supposed to be accessed by the device. So you can invalidate the cache lines to be sure that the that there is no caching, that the CPU does not have any cache uh, left for that for that location. This is mainly used in all sorts of streaming I.O. So like, net, for example, a network packet comes in, you give it a network buffer, you give it the address of the network buffer, then you, you flush the cache lines for those for that bit, and then when you get the interrupt that the transfer is finished, you read it and you will be sure that the process will go back to memory. Another way is that you can also declare memory to be non-cacheable. This is mainly useful for things you have to update, you have to read and update f fairly often, or in some cases, memory you don't really have to access more than once. Like if you have, if for example, microcode, which is in, in main memory, and which gets fetched by the MA by the device, you only have to load it there once and then start the device and you, actually, you seldomly have to touch it anymore. Ring buffers are, are an example of the other case. These are mainly used to store pointers and status information, so you have to frequently update those. And then it becomes rather annoying to have all, with, all you have cache flushes. Addressing is an, another interesting topic and one which also leads to a lot of, of can lead to a lot of portability problems. There are basically two, three sorts of addresses in the system. We have a virtual address, which is what no, normally kernel and applications use. That one gets translated via an, an MMU or page, page table to a physical address. The physical address is, is actually the address which appears on the front side bus in case of an Intel system, mostly. Then obviously you have bus addresses. Obviously, if you have multiple peripherals, you also need to indicate which peripheral you want to access and which register of the peripheral you want to access. And also, in that case, addresses are used. For in, to, be a, to give a more concrete example, PC, on, they have obviously addresses on a PCI bus, which are the ones you see in, if you do LS PCI, you'll see those bar, base address registers filled with, with, with values. Most of them are the addresses uh, of, the, of the register spaces. Um, yeah, but obviously on an Intel system this is quite simple because actually all physical addresses which do not correspond to memory, so the Northbridge sees the physical address, it will, it, it has been configured to see how, to know how much memory is available, and any address, address which is beyond that area will be automatically forwarded to the PCI bus. But this is not true on all systems, on, for example Alpha systems, PowerPC, um, the bus address might be an might be an offset. There might be an offset uh, between the bus address and the physical address. Being, if you want to access PCI bus address zero, you have to actually access physical address eight f and then seven times zero, for example. Um, there are multiple. Yeah, there are a number of translations possible. Identity mapped is the easier one. That's the Intel case. Fixed offset is what I explained. Uh, it can also be page-based, for example, Alphas, and I think also AMD64 support uh, and trust and a, a sort of a page table between the accesses coming from PCI and going towards main memory. Um, so this page table has to be set up first before the accesses actually work. Then there are also cases of, of bus addresses which are not memory mapped. Uh, the I.O. ports on, on in typical Intel Pro x86 processor are probably the most well-known example because you have to use special instructions to actually generate those cycles. Uh, IBM 
Embedded power PCs also have something like that. They call device control bus. They also have to use special uh, movement move instructions to actually access those. Um, the best solution to cope with this problem is to always provide some sort of an abstraction function to hardware. So never just dereference the address you have, but try to and try to to have an abstraction like write word, write byte, or some, or read word, write byte, or read byte, and have them do the right thing. Then the atom atomicity. You can obviously have multiple processors. You can also have multiple bus masters on PCI. Obviously, if you want to read and write, in some cases you want to be sure that the access is atomic because otherwise that that, that is the the other end which wants which needs the information will always see see a consistent uh, image. Um, reads and writes are generally atomic, but most only, but in most, but almost always only if they are aligned. If you are doing unaligned access, it might not be atomic. If you do, in some cases, you need to do an atomic read modify write. That's obviously a different. That's obviously more complicated because you can't do that in a single instruction. Um, on on Intel, you have a, a special log prefix to do that, which only works on exchange. And I think one other instruction. If you do if you do it on another instruction, I think you get an illegal instruction exception. Um, MIPS, PowerPC, and ARM use a bit of similar scheme. They actually have a strategy in which you can retry the access. So they you load it, then you set a specific bit, um, and the processor will watch if someone else is, was trying to access that memory location. Then you do the store, and the result of the store will tell you if someone else accessed the memory location or not, and if it fails, so because this was someone else looked at the, at the data while you were accessi accessing it, or while you, process, while you were processing, then you have to restart again. ARM has a swap instruction, which is, I believe, fairly similar to the Intel one, but I have seen it fairly seldomly used. I think mainly because there are no SMP ARM machines. Um, obviously, you can't rely on this sort of behavior if you have bus bridges. Don't think you can do an atomic transaction in video memory or other sort of memory living on a PCI, a PCI card which sits behind three bridges because those bridges may, may not just not support any form of logging. Generally, if you want to use, if you want to be sure that you, if you want to rely on CPU logging, you have to do it in main memory. As you, yeah, I think by now it should be clear that if you try to access hardware from user land, you, you will run into all sorts of interesting problems. Um, in general, I think it's best to not to do that. You can do it. You can M up def, def mem, or you can M up PCI devices and start accessing them. But your code will be likely highly unportable. Um, the best solution or the best strategy against this problem, I think, is to separate the transport of the commands from the actual logic of the driver. I think there are a few nice examples in Linux which already implement sort of this idea. Firewire, for example, there is a library, Libra3094, which allows you to directly access Firewire devices from user land. In that case, the, um, the, the actual application does not have to know on how to access PCI, how to talk with the Firewire controller. It only has to know, to know how to speak the Firewire protocol with the, div the, the protocol which, which, implements, which is implemented by the device. This is indeed mainly used for this is used, for example, for, for uh, in grab DV to to grab the DV frames from a video camera. It's also used in FreeBob for audio over FireWire. Um, yeah, I think that's the most common applications. For USB, there is something similar. It's called LibUSB, and there are quite some packages which actually use this. I think GPhoto is one of them. I believe Sane might use it too. Um, and there are various more less well-known gadgets which have only have user land programs which, which are accessed via LibUSB. Um, SCSI and, and Atapi device actually have something similar. Um, there is a generic IOCTL which allows you to su submit any sort of SCSI or Atapi command. And the most well-known well use is probably CD record or other programs which write CDs or DVDs. There are probably other uh, examples of this sort of schemes as well. Uh, yeah, you wanted to ask a question? Yes. I just want to precise that using LibUSB, for example, gives high portability on other kernels, for example. You can use it on FreeBSD. You can use it on Mac OS X or even on Windows. So it, or yeah. your program will, will have high portability. 
Yeah, that's yeah. Obviously, if you have a library, you, the li the interfaces can also be implemented in the, on another operating system, even even if the backend is different. That's, so that's another adv another reason to use the libraries if they are available. Um, if you really have to do user land hardware access, then I think I strongly s advise you to use the abstraction layer because sooner or later someone will re realize, someone will come to you like, hey, your uh, driver and board does not work on my uh, 15 CPU mix MIPS system with five PCI bridges and this strange memory mapping, please fix it. <laughs> so then the only way to, to have to cope with this sort of architecture problems is to have an abstraction layer which realize, which, which, so that you don't have to, to mess around in all of the code to solve this issue. Okay. I. I think I'm almost at the end of my Hello? of my bit. <laughs> there uh, are any more questions? Ah, yeah. Okay, F uh, Lars. Yeah. Uh, there is hardware out there that does things in a specific byte order, and doesn't. So, despite the fact you're using libusb, you find that the hardware is assuming that certain byte order is out is being used. Yeah, obviously, yeah. That that's a very good remark. The um, the libusb guarantees you that the bytes you have in your the bytes you have in your user land buffer will be transferred to the device and, and vice versa. But obviously the messages themselves might have probably have an NDN specific layout and obviously you sh you should make sure that your program copes with that properly. But at least you don't have to you can act, act, at least write a user land program in a portable way which works with USB devices. Yeah, there is another example I didn't mention that is for part port, there is also something like that. Um, but I don't recall the name anymore, which allows you to actually hardware independently access the parallel port stuff from user land. Yeah, I don't know if there are any more questions. It doesn't look like it. So, I sh Steve, I should just you continue with uh, your part of the slides. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, With the change of speaker here, we are going to have a little bit of a change of focus. Um, obviously, you can tell Peter uh, has given you lots of good information about hardware-specific porting issues, um, many of which are specific to kernel land, in fact, that you usually will not run into. Uh, for, for my portion of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on things that you're going to run into in the process of maintaining Debian packages specifically, things you will see uh, in the wild on one or more of our architectures that uh, result in a package failing to build. And just to let you know what the, the overall format is going to be for the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes or so, um, I'm going to start out talking a little bit. I have a few more slides. Then I'm going to take about a five minute break um, during which I'd like people to go ahead and get organized into groups if they want to stick around for the, the workshop portion where we will actually be tackling a few build failures that are that have been handpicked from the build logs on uh, buildd.debian.org so that we can go ahead and actually see how some of these build failures need to be addressed uh, so you get some practical hands-on experience with re resolving bugs of those kinds so that next time they happen to your packages you don't have to come to a workshop like this to actually get them fixed so um, j that's just to let you know what we're going into here um, let's see I do have one URL on the server which I don't have listed on the slides and it's going to be of use to you if you do have a, a computer here and you want to go ahead and get that loaded up right now, I'll give you that URL. It's ftp colon slash slash uh, homer and it's in the share directory so it's slash share slash porting uh, slash workshop dash links dot html. Was that, did I speak that clearly enough that everybody got the URL? I see neither yeses nor noes. One yes, okay, moving on. Okay, so when we're looking at build failures, uh, they generally fall into uh, 
there are a number of categories that you'll find build failures falling into. First of all, you can have just plain software bugs in your package where the software does not handle the, 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 the architecture specific hardware details or processor memory details, whatever that may be, correctly. Um, which, as we went through, surprisingly, very few of the current build failures that we were able to find for this talk fall into that category. It seems as though the porters are pretty good about making sure we get rid of all of those, and so we get into different categories of build errors, which are the, the main ones that we're really dealing with today uh, when trying to make sure that Debian is ported to the different operating systems. Um, you can also have architecture-specific build dependency problems. Uh, for example, if your package build depends on Java, you will see that it will fail on some architectures uh, due to there not being a viable Java implementation today for all of our architectures. That's something that we hope will eventually be resolved, but it's a tool chain issue that's just not in place yet that uh, we, you know, we don't have a solution for Java on all of our architectures at this point. You may have build depends being temporarily unavailable at the time the build daemon tried to build the package, in which case you will see build failures for that, which are build failures you just need to talk to the build daemon maintainers about in order to get your package retried. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead with a question, Manoj. Uh, is there a standard process for asking for a package that will be retried other than just uh, floating it on the build? The question was, is there a standard way to contact main, uh, the build D maintainers in order to request the requeue of a package? The answer is that there are aliases set up where it's architecture name at builddebian.org, which is the address you can send um, requests to. Those don't necessarily guarantee that your request will be processed any faster than it would normally because the build D maintainers each do have their own approach for handling failed builds and some of them, you know, just more or less ignore the mail and process them in order regardless. Um, eventually they do get to all of those failures regardless and, and they do uh, eventually get given back. But if it's something that you know that, it, it, you know, you can communicate with them. Actually IRC tends to be more effective if you, in, in practice, if you talk to the, the maintainer there and, and uh, Yeah, just uh, telling everyone, please, use as little wireless as possible. Uh, if you, we should have quality of service, but for some reason, it does not stop your packets. So please use wireless only if you really have to and use as little bandwidth as possible because the streams are useless right now. Thanks. Um, going on here. Uh, you may have a, a case where your build dependency is in the archive, but you're missing a version number on it, so your package will succeed in building on some architectures where a newer version of your build dependency became available before the build detried your package, and then on other architectures where that version build dependency did not become available first, it will fail, and so you'll have, that'll be, you'll look at those and see that a different version of the build dependency was used and that's the common theme in, in why it failed on one architecture versus another. You can find tool chain specific bugs where the, you will have things like GCC in the middle of building your package decides uh, it throws an internal compiler error. That's almost always a tool chain issue rather than a bug in your package. That doesn't mean you can ignore it because your package isn't going to go anywhere if this happens on a release architecture and you're trying to get it updated into etch and you know it's not building then it is an issue that you have to deal with rather than just saying, oh, well, then, you know, the architecture doesn't work or the, the compiler doesn't work. You can't just ignore those, those kinds of things. Uh, you can have build failures that are specific to a build environment. Um, in particular, we have three architectures in Debian, which are Alpha, MIPS, and MIPSL, which use dpackage build package dash r sudo instead of fake root, as most people are used to using for package builds. Uh, that was put in place on those particular architectures at one time or another due to problems with fake root that existed on the architectures when it was implemented. As far as I know, fake root is now 
functioning correctly on all those architectures. Nevertheless, your packages are supposed to build correctly when, when using our pseudo as opposed to our fake root. So you will see some cases, including some that we'll see a little bit later, where alpha, MIPS, and MIPS will fail, everything else succeeds, and it's because those buildies use pseudo, and your package can't cope with that. And then you can just find some build failures, which are just plain build these specific bugs. The most uh, recent, uh, the most common cases of those we've had recently have been problems with the HPPA build D randomly having bash seg fault. Um, <laughs> rather, um, not obvious, it's obviously not anything you can fix um, because you know if bash seg faults, it's not your fault. So you really have to go back and, and just get that package requeued as well. We have a question here with uh, Lars. Uh, another cause of uh, build D failures, which actually I haven't seen in the past month or two, anyway, is corrupted S build environments on uh, build Ds, where a buggy package doesn't uninstall itself cleanly, and then it caught the S build ch root on the build D gets corrupted. And then your package won't build because of a different package had a bug in a previous release. Right, that's a good point. Um, we do actually hope we have those bugs fixed. There was actually a dpackage bug prior to the Sarge release where dpackage would not correctly handle rolling back an attempt to purge a package directly. If you tried to purge a package and the post RM script failed, dpackage would say, oh, well, it failed, but no, you already did everything you needed to, so we'll consider it uninstalled. Well, or I, I'm sorry, no, we would, what it would do is it would remove the files, because it's in the post RM already. It's removed the files, runs the post RM script, the post RM script failed, so what it did was it, it would roll back the state and say, oh, the package is installed, is what it would do. And so you would see this manifesting in, in build logs as, oh, your build dependencies are already installed, and it goes through to build the package, and, well, it fails because a major file that's supposed to be part of the package you build depend on just isn't there. Um, but we think that dpackage bug is actually fixed now, so in general, packages failing to purge correctly should not be breaking build Ds at this point as far as I'm aware. Uh, okay, so yeah, so those are the various categories of build failures you can run into. And, you know, in order to deal with them, first of all, you have to notice that your package has failed to build. I'm sorry, go ahead, Joss. There, there have also been um, build failures related to package not purging because of uh, circular dependencies. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Some, there were some build failures because the, some package in the previous build refused to remove because of circular dependencies. And uh, this also broke the build daemon environment. Um, okay, I can't say that I've seen any of those, but that's, yeah, don't do circular dependencies, they're bad. Um. <laughs> So yeah, the first thing you have to do is actually have noticed that your package isn't building in order to do anything about it. And there are a number of resources out there, whether you are a porter or whether you are a package maintainer, whatever your involvement is in Debian, where you want to make sure that packages are building correctly, um, there are pages for you to watch that will tell you what's going on. Um, the, the URLs that I have here, which I, in that link I gave you earlier, um, I've got those links in there as well, so you shouldn't have to cut and paste all of these. Um, there's a, the, the, a lot of people have been using the people.debian.org. Um, Igloo has a page set up, status.php, which allows you to look by maintainer how packages are doing across all architectures. One thing that's kind of missing from this is that it doesn't really interface with build logs in the event of failures. Um, so if a package has failed to build, I think it just simply shows up as, as being building. I don't know if it actually shows up as, does it show up as, okay, that's right. It does show up as maybe failed. 
I, I got confused because I looked at this page just before and I looked at it on my own packages and it was showing several of my packages as building where they had actually failed, um, but they had failed within an hour or two of me looking and so it, it had not checked that to know that the packages had failed. So ignore that comment. It's actually, this will give you pretty current information about whether your packages are building correctly on all architectures. After you do an upload, it's a, it's a very good idea to look at this page you know, a day later and see where things are to see whether your packages are all actually building or not. Uh, there's also a page directly on buildy.debian.org. Uh, Ryan Murray has recently added this address where you can check the status, the wanna build status of a package just by buildy.debian.org slash package name. And that's the source package name. And it will show you its status across all architectures so you can see whether it's actually gotten built or not. Um, and Yehun back there also has another page on buildy.debian.org which allows you to check um, the general status of all packages in wanna build for architecture. You can get at this information from some other pages on buildd.debian.org that are part of the main buildd site. What this page specifically lets you do is it lets you link directly to build failure logs if there's a problem and it also documents things as maybe failed in, in the event that it's, uh, there's a, a log that looks like the build failed, well the, the build did fail because it didn't produce any packages but it has not been marked as failed by the buildd maintainer or anything like that. And whichever one of these pages you, you start out from, eventually what you're getting to is you're going to end up at a, a, a build log which shows you everything that uh, happened when, when the build daemon tried to build that package and what exactly went wrong. And that's where the meat of this, this process is, is looking through that build log and, and usually at the end, but sometimes way far up from the end, um, exactly what happened and when it went wrong. So now that we've got this, we know that we have a package that failed. In this example, we're gonna look at DB 4.3 first. Um, uh, and this, this is a, a, a known failure, um, which I guess if the wireless doesn't really allow it at this point, um, there's no sense in going ahead and looking at that right now. Um, the exact failure is, is copied there, exactly what's happening. And we see in this case, it's, a, it's an unmet dependency of Java GCJ compat dash dev depends such and such, but it is not going to be installed. This is an error that everybody I'm sure has seen at some point or another just running apt on their own systems. And you know, what do you do with a, a build failure like this? Well, you know, this is not a bug in DB 4.3's upstream code because it's doing the right thing. It's, it's portable code. It's just not portable to platforms that don't have the correct Java available. And in this case, it appears that HPPA does not have a Java that's known to be correct and usable with the DB 4.3 Java bindings. Um, that doesn't make it a bug that we can ignore. DB 4.3 and DB 4.4 both have this particular bug um, on HPPA right now where they are not moving into testing. Uh, the newest versions are not moving into testing because uh, that's not available. But nevertheless, as I say there, it is out of scope for the for this workshop, we're not going to be trying to fix missing build dependencies on Java. I'm not asking anybody today to, um, yes, please port Java to HPPA or any of the other architectures for me. That doesn't fit in 45 minutes. What is the recommended solution? Uh, in case if, you know, you, sorry, let me start again. What is the recommended solution in this case? We have got a build dependency that is available only on a subset of the release architectures. It might not be feasible to port the build dependency over to those architectures. It might just be too hard to get done in the time. We still want the package, presumably, on the architectures where it is possible to have it on. Can't we just decide and say that it's, it didn't ever build on that architecture or it has been removed from that architecture and it's only supported on the subset that it does work on? Yes, that's a good question. In terms of releasability of a package, the actual requirement is not that your package builds on all architectures. The requirement is that it, 
is supported, it, that it, it, it's available and current on all architectures where it can reasonably be supported. And how we normally define reasonably be supported is, did a previous version of your package build on that architecture? If it did, well, it was, it, it was supported at one time, so why can't you support it now is usually how the reasoning goes. Uh, there are cir extenuating circumstances when that's not possible and that's something that the maintainer should work out with the porters for that architecture what the porters believe is the appropriate solution. If the build dependency, if they think it's you know something that they need to have ported and that it would be inappropriate to remove the old version of your package, or that's an option, they may say yes, if it's not ported, you know, we the, the code that, that's supposed to be ported in order to make this work is code we can't imagine getting to work on our architecture anytime this year. Um, and yes, in that case, they would go ahead and, and authorize removing that from, from, the from the archive on that architecture. All right. Uh, if I may follow up on this, what happens in a more complicated situation in which, say, on some release architectures, you need the old version of your package? But on some other architectures, you need the new version because you know the world has moved on. Can we release Edge, for example, with mismatched versions of package X? I'm assuming X is a hypothetical variable there, foo. and not a <laughs> right. Let's say package foo. Uh, can we release with multiple versions of a package across architectures? Conditionally, yes. Um, I've yet to see a case where I felt it was actually valuable to do that. I mean, other than things like the tool chain. GCC, we've got currently four different versions of GCC in the archive, yeah, at least four. And some of them work better than others on different architectures. And there's currently a discussion about whether we're going to try to move to GCC 4.1 as default for Etch and on which architectures will do that and what the compiler will be on the other architectures and so on and so forth. That's kind of a, that, that's a special case. If we're talking about the package used to build, now the new version doesn't build, can we just ship the old binaries? Well, yeah, we also have to ship the old source and is the package itself really that valuable if it doesn't even, if the new version doesn't build, is it, is it actually that valuable that we want to effectively bloat the archive by having you know, two source packages carried around for that? In my experience, the answer is almost always no. I'm getting an FTP assistant shaking his head at me. I'm not sure what that means, but yeah. <laughs> Right, that's a good point. Uh, Jovan was pointing out that in the event that you don't have, in the event that all the architectures you're shipping aren't built from the current source version, the archive software will not allow you to do security updates for the out-of-date architectures. So the only way to actually do that if you are going to, to say, let's ship different versions on different architectures is really to make it too, he didn't have a question. I repeated his comment. <laughs> um, break my train of thought here. Uh, that yes, we would have to actually create two different source packages for the old versus the new version and give them different names in order to allow that to exist in the archive without causing problems for security support and other kinds of updates within a release. Okay, um, moving on. So now we've we've found the build log and. Well, you have to go through and read it to figure out what's going on in, in this package. Um, and one of the things that Peter was talking about earlier was people writing software which assumes that pointers and ints are the same size. As I mentioned, this is increasingly uncommon, fortunately, um, in the software we have in Debian for this to be an issue, or at least for this issue to stay around very long. The AMD64 porters in particular have taken a machete to all of the packages that uh, had this problem in the archive. And so now that there is a, a 
popular 64-bit architecture running around. There's very little code remaining in the archive, which has problems on 64-bit architectures due to this assumption. Um, there are still some. I've given you an example here, which is SWT-GTK. Uh, this failure, I happen to have linked to the alpha build log for it, but this failure exists on all of our 64-bit architectures. And what it comes down to basically is this is one we cannot fix today or anytime soon because Java in its APIs makes certain assumptions about the sizes of types that it exports. And so you cannot just say, oh, well, this has to be big enough to store a pointer, so we'll change the type of it because then the things that are expecting the type to be of a different size break instead. And so that's a hairy one that we've had going on lately. Um, so there's also a class of these types of pointer integer bugs that doesn't cause a GCC error, at least if you don't have W error turned on. Um, and that is where you have implicit pointer conversions where GCC doesn't know the prototype of the function you're ret that's returning a pointer and it will convert it back to an integer. That will work fine on 32-bit architectures, but on AMD 64, I64, that'll actually cause uh, a seg fault at runtime. Uh, David Rosberger's written a filter for this and I run all the build D logs off these architectures through it. Um, as an aside, I'm looking for um, additional things that will parse build D logs and look for class problems that I can add into this. And if we can do that, we can catch a lot of stuff that don't necessarily cause a build failure, but can cause failures at runtime. Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a good point as well. I, um, that brings to mind another class of, of failures, which are pointer to int failures, which are not caught by the build Ds automatically. And that's when um, some brilliant programmer has decided to explicitly cast his pointer to an int before passing it back. <laughs> And there seem to be a lot of examples of this running around among people using G object. And I do not know why that is. I've asked people if there's some example tutorial out there where people are being taught to program this way so that I can pick up the manual, print it out, and bludgeon whoever wrote it. They, they assure me that there's no such manual. But uh, yeah, G type is a pointer. Don't cast it to a G int before you return it. That's not good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, here's another example of build failures. This one is the free type package, which uh, on alpha MIPS and MIPSL it fails because those are the architectures that use our sudo when they're running the command, the parts of the build that have to be run as root. And although we've seen some problems before with, with packages that don't run the same, that don't build the same under fake root and sudo, this, one, this is a, a fun new class of them uh, as a result of behavior changes in sudo, where sudo no longer passes most of your environment variables, uh, including the one that tells you what your current directory is. So you'll get to take a look at this build log. Some group of you will get to take a look at this particular build log a little bit later and see exactly what's going on there and uh, you know what it takes in order to fix that. But yeah, here's, here's an example of the lines from the build log which shows you something a little bit long, something's a little bit wrong, is that it's trying to remove files in slash Debian. Well, <laughs> I don't usually have a slash Debian when I'm building packages or any other time, to be honest. And I think this is my final slide, uh, which is that step three, once you've identified that there's a failure and started looking at the build log, Step three is that you have to start hacking. There's no magic formula for fixing all of these build failures. You will learn to recognize certain kinds of build failures so that you can, so that you can fix them fairly quickly. But I can't in this session you know, tell you follow these steps exactly and you will never have again have to think about a build failure because you will. You will encounter new and different kinds of porting bugs as you go along. But um, after our little five minute break, I'd love to uh, have some of you stay around who are interested in doing some porting fixing and uh, we'll... Uh, the question was, do you need a laptop for that? Well, I'm actually hoping to do this in groups because I don't have enough material to go around and give everybody their own porting bug to fix. I'd love if I could, you know, just give everybody a bug and say, okay, well, uh, my goal for this session is to have 70 RC bugs fixed when we leave. but. 
real, realistically, um, I'm, we're going to be working in groups. And so, yeah, there will be, need to be a laptop per group, but it's not going to be anything like everybody needs one. Um, so yeah, let's take five minutes here and um, people can shuffle around. People who don't want to stick around for the workshop can um, go ahead and get up and leave at this point. Uh, the streaming is going to suffer massively because I'm going to have people logging into remote build these and I consider that more important than the streaming. So as much as I love all you viewers out there, <laughs> we're going to have to make some compromises here if that's what it takes. <coughs> Oh, do we have? Uh, <laughs> thought we had a question, and we do not. Okay.